Good morning, friends. I hope you're doing well today. Now, today we're going to continue with Jeremiah, moving to chapter 20. The reason we're jumping to chapter 20 is because in chapter 20, there's this beautiful moment where we get to hear Jeremiah's heart in a not so happy way. And that's because Jeremiah is, he's known as the weeping prophet um, because he was given a hard task, a really hard task. And the hardness of it reflects itself in his soul and in the way he's treated. And so let me give you a little backstory building up to this. Now in chapter 19, Jeremiah is told by God, I want you to go to a potter and buy some pottery. Once again, this is just the kind of thing that we seem to see a lot of in Jeremiah. God, you know, using these visual examples. So Jeremiah goes and he buys some pottery. And then he says, I want you to go. I'm pretty sure he goes to the temple. And he goes to the temple there and God says, I want you to tell the people of Judah that I'm going to crush them as this pottery is crushed. That they will find themselves broken, their walls broken down, find themselves in poverty and worse. It's a, just a, a horrible warning. So there in front of the temple, Jeremiah walks in, he gets everybody's attention. He smashes the flask, he points at it and he says, this is what God is going to do to Jerusalem. Now, because he says that, one of the priests, a priest by the name of Pasher, the son of Immer, who is a chief officer of the house of the Lord, decides that that's got to be heresy. You can't say that God's going to do such mean things to his people. God's a nice God. And so Pasher has Jeremiah locked up and put in the stocks where people can, you know, you know what the stocks are. That's where you're hung up and people throw things at you and they mock you and so Jeremiah goes through a period where he's in the stocks, and then after that he's thrown into a prison. While he's there, he makes a, a pronouncement, a prophecy about Pashur that's not nice either. He says, Pashur, you and your family, you're going to go into slavery. You will be, the you know, hooks will be put through your nose. You'll be dragged away. Not exciting and good news for Pashur. But the second half of chapter 20 is what I want to look at. Because Jeremiah also finds himself at a real low point here. Just feeling beaten. Feeling like the task that God has given him is too much for him. Uh, too great. He's too wounded. So here are his words. And I love his heart. The way he just pours it all out to God. Recording it. Writing it down so that now we hear well over 2,500 years later. can Almost 2,600 years later. Can read this and say... Here's a man who was at his end in his obedience. He was, he was doing his best to honor God and to serve God and to obey God. And he brought even the broken pieces of himself, the exhausted pieces of himself to God. So let's read this text together. So I'm going to begin in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 7. And as I read, I mean, the point, that reason we're looking at this is frequently we think we have to clean up our feelings before we bring them to God. That God is a God who only receives us if we're happy or if we're worshipful. Jeremiah, the prophet, hear his words and understand that he says this to God because God is the one who he knows will hear him. When in the rest of the city of Jerusalem, no one would hear and understand what he's going through. Oh Lord, he begins, you have deceived me and I was deceived. You are stronger than I and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. I, um, boom, that's great language. So what do we have here? We have two things. Let's just summarize those first few verses. Lord, you have deceived me, or I have deceived my, I was deceived. So the image that he begins with is he thought maybe that this prophet thing was going to be an easy task, that he would bring some bad messages, some good messages, maybe some fame would come with it. But he discovers that this, you are stronger than I, you have prevailed. And so he says, I can't help it. I'm just preaching what you've told me to preach as hard as it is. And I speak these words and they become for me a mockery. People know what I'm going to stay. They, they know that I'm coming to give them bad, bad news and they mock me for it. But yet at the same time, when I don't speak it, when I keep my mouth shut, it burns inside me the passion to speak your word, the passion to, 
to say what you have told me I must say consumes me, and so I have to go out there and say it. And I'm weary holding it in, I cannot, for I hear many, many whispering. Terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us announce, denounce him. Say all my close friends watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, and then we can overcome him and take our vengeance on him. So that he says that even my close friends are just looking for an opportunity to prove me wrong. So that they can prove that all these terrible things that I'm saying aren't true. They're looking for that opportunity for him to be a false prophet. If he says, if he is deceived and says one message that's wrong, that's enough for them to say, you're not a prophet anymore. And actually, that's kind of the way it's supposed to be, right? You don't listen to a prophet who keeps prophesying that, you know, somebody's going to be president again, for example. And, oh, he's not president now. Well, he's going to come back and be president again, for example. Oh, you know, if that prophet got it wrong the first time, he's probably going to get it wrong the second time. Um, just for example, but that's how it works. We, we're told to judge prophets, and when prophets fail, we don't treat them as prophets anymore. That's what his friends are trying to do. They're looking for an opportunity to prove him wrong because they don't like his message, but yet they can't. Because the Lord is with me as a dread warrior, therefore my prosecutors stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will not be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. And so we find Jeremiah saying that in this hard place where it's me versus the world, the world will fall because I am here with God and God is my dread warrior. Powerful words to describe the one who will stand before Jeremiah and judge. And Jeremiah says, let the judgment come. And remember the contrast here is Jeremiah is speaking truth and the truth words that he's speaking are words calling for repentance, but the people aren't repenting. If there was that repentance, perhaps the Lord would change his heart, but the people's hearts are hardened. Remember yesterday's message. God says, I will take a steel or an iron pen and put a diamond tip on it so that I can write on your heart. He's saying their hearts are hard stone, very hard stone. And that's the hearts of a people who cannot hear the word of the Lord. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, Jeremiah says, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. So this is the end. In the midst of his despair, he says, I just feel so alone, so overwhelmed. This isn't what I turned out to be. Um, in the midst of it, your, your word burns within me, and so I have to say it. But yet I trust you to defend me. I trust you to be the righteous shield for me, and that you will be the one who in the end brings justice. But then verse 13, we move from despair into worship because he's reminded himself that God is the one who sits on the throne. He says, Sing to the Lord, praise to the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. So he says, I will praise the Lord. But then look at what he says after that. He says, Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning, an alarm at noon, because he did not kill me in the womb, so that my mother would have been my grave, and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow and to spend my days in shame? So here there's this moment in this text where Jeremiah lifts his eyes up and he says, Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. So he trusts that in the face of evildoers, God is doing, God will deliver him from them. But he says, but yet, it's, it would have been better if I had never been born, if I had been um, killed in the womb, because the life that I have brought been brought into is one of such toil and such sorrow and I spend my days in shame I spend my days being mocked by a people who say you're very unpatriotic you're not saying good things about Jerusalem and he says I'm just speaking the word of the Lord and for that I have been uh, made to be a pariah 
So the wonderful thing about this text is he he doesn't he brings it. He pours out his heart, and we're going to see that he continues to do that, especially as we come to the book of Lamentations. It's not necessarily happy, is it? It doesn't resolve itself neatly into a nice package with a bow. And Jeremiah's life is not one that's going to end with a bow and with a wedding and with a celebration. But he's going to honor God with his life, and God will honor him in return. And that's the journey that we're on. And so we can give thanks to God that he shows us here this example of a Christian going through hard times. Because I know that many of you are going through hard times. They might not be Jeremiah hard times. They might feel at days and times like Jeremiah's hard times. But the truth is God is with us. His love for us is the promise that we can lean into. And I really don't say this enough in this time, but yet this is the whole point of what we're doing here, is simply this, God loves us. God loves us. God loves you. And he loves you in the midst of that hard time, in the midst of that despair, in the midst of that mourning, in the midst of that broken spirit. He loves you enough that he died for you, that he rose from the graves, so that you might have life, and he might call you son or daughter that he might delight in you enough to even call you bride of Christ. It's that love that we lean into, just as Jeremiah leaned into the trust that God would in the end defend him, even as it seemed like the whole of Jerusalem was against him. So today my prayer for you is that you would lean into the love of Christ. Lean in with all of the brokenness, with all of the despair, with all of the anger, with all of the... Uh, the worry and the hurt and the anxiety that you carry, lean into God. Bring that to God and know that his love is greater than all of those things. He is the dread warrior on your behalf. He's that mother hand who would gather you into his arms and comfort you. Let's pray. Father, we praise you today for all that you are. And we bring ourselves to you. brokenhearted, angry, despairing, bitter, depressed, um, facing mourning, facing death, facing sickness, facing bitterness at what has not happened that should have, perhaps, facing injustice and even woundedness, we come to you. Hear our cries, hear our hearts, heal our hearts, we pray. And help us to be, as Jeremiah was, burning in the, in the core of our being, a burning fire in our bones, lest we proclaim the love of Christ. Because the whole world needs to know how great your love is. That there is a judgment coming, but there is a Savior that has come. Help us to proclaim these two things as we worship you and as we go out from this place today. Guide us, we pray, for your glory. Amen. Well, thank you today again for joining me. I hope that you have a beautiful day. God bless you all. Bye-bye.